So Lakshmi Devi, she charged a high price. And the king and queen bought this cow with the calf. And there was a cowherd man who every day took those cows out to the pastures to graze on the grasses. And in the evening, the cows would come back, would be milked. Many days went by, and there was no milk coming from this special cow. She had just had a calf. There is no reason for this. The queen went to the Goshala. Where? So many days. Where is the milk from this prized cow? We spent so much. Where is the milk from this prized cow? She went to the cowherd man. Are you drinking it? Are you stealing it? He said, no, no, I'm not. Honest, I'm not. If tomorrow there is no milk, then I know you are. And you will be punished with your life. Now what happened is this. At a certain time every day during the grazing of the cows, this cowherd man would take a nap. He would go to sleep under a tree. And right when he went to sleep, that Brahma cow would run to the anthill and stand right over the anthill with her utter and then pour profusely nectarine, delicious, nutritious milk down. And Srinivas, accepting the loving offering of his devotee, look up, open his mouth, and the milk would come right into his mouth to feed him for the day. This was going on every day. This cow is a very, very faithful devotee. So on this particular day, the cowherd man pretended to go to sleep, but slightly kept one eye open to watch the cow. He saw that cow running. He saw that cow standing over an anthill, milk pouring down into the ground. Oh, he was furious. It was unbelievable. He was about to be killed because of this restless cow. He lost all intelligence. Krishna tells in Gita, when there is anger, one loses one's intelligence falls down into abominable activities. So this cowherd man in a rage of fury picked up an axe and attacked it and hurled the axe to cut off the head of the cow. But as the axe was coming down, Srinivas leaped up and blocked the razor sharp edge of the axe with his own forehead. When the cowherd man saw the most beautiful personality standing before him, bleeding profusely, he fell down unconscious. And news came to the king of what had happened. He came running to the place. When he first saw his, his, his servant, the cowherd man, laying unconscious, he thought he was killed. He saw blood all around. He was about to attack and chastise whoever that person was. But when he looked closely at him, he was the embodiment of all opulence and beauty. He understood that he was a special personality. And the king asked, what has happened? And Srinivas explained exactly. King begged forgiveness. Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmani Hitaya Chaja Gari Hitaya Krishnaya Govindaya Namo Namaha. We chant this prayer, but do we really acknowledge the significance of it? Krishna is very fond of giving protection to the cows and the Brahmins. In the story of Brigamuni, we see he tolerated the injustice of being kicked in the chest and forgave a Brahmin. And here he's showing his love for the cow. To save a cow, 
He's willing to endure the pain of an axe penetrating his own head. So he walked into the forest and he was bleeding and feeling much pain. This is the Leela of the Lord. And then Prihaspati, the priest of the demigods approached him. He asked Prihaspati, can you tell me an herbal remedy to alleviate the pain and the, and the injury of my head? Prihaspati explained exactly the herbs that were required. So he was searching for those herbs. And at that time, he came to Varahakshetra, where he met Lord Varahadev. Previously, in the Satya Yuga, Hiranyaksha, with his demoniac power to please his elder brother Hiranyakashipu, created such chaos in this world that the earth planet, Buloka, was cast to the bottom of the Garabodak Ocean. At that time, the sages and the demigods, they were helpless. They did not know what to do. They approached Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma prayed to the Supreme Lord Vishnu, and in the course of his prayer, a very small little boar creature came out of his nose, the size of a thumb. Instantly it grew larger and larger and larger until it was like a huge mountain. He had most exquisite lotus-like eyes. Although he was a boar, which is a wild pig, which is generally considered a very ugly animal, Sometimes we praise people by comparing them to animals. Fearless like a lion. Fast like a tiger. Yes. Graceful like a swan. Sings like a cuckoo. But have you heard ever in your life or read in any books anybody being glorified by being compared to a pig? You're sloppy like a pig. <laughs> You're ugly like a pig. If someone calls you a swan, you feel very nice. If someone calls you a lion, you feel very nice. But if someone calls you a hog, you are a pig. It's an insult. It's a very great insult. But when Lord Varaha, the Supreme Personality of God, had took the form of a, of a boar, a wild pig, was the personification of all opulences. He possessed all the six opulences. He was beautiful. He was hypnotizing people. Everyone was, all the great devotees were falling in love with him. That is the greatness of the Lord's power. How wonderful is our Lord? A Shakti. He could do anything. And how he does everything. Anyone who does not have faith in these stories is the most unfortunate, dull-headed person in all of creation. The Lord is so amazing that he could take the form of the most abominable of all animals and be all attractive so that people are falling unconscious by the beauty of this boar. People are offering prayers with tears pouring out of their eyes out of love for this boar. Shri Varaha Bhagavan Ki! Why not? If Krishna wants to show his opulence, why not take the most despicable, abominable, obnoxious of all animals and show his glories and opulences and beauty and enchant everyone's heart in that form? That is the Lord's greatness. And he lifted the earth with the tusks. Jayadev Goswami sings in his Das Avatar Stotra.
after he saved the earth and delivered Hiranyaksha, Bhudevi, the presiding deity of this planet, she prayed to Lord Garaha that please make a home on earth where I can be your consort and live with you. Please make a home here. So of all places, Lord Varaha Dev chose what he considered the most beautiful place on earth. The Tirumala Hills. On the top of this hill, Tirumala, it is called Varaha Kshetra. Devi gave this land to Lord Varaha Dev where they lived together very happily. So Srinivas came and he asked for a place to reside here. Please listen carefully. Lord Varaha Dev gave him a tract of land. Srinivas said, if I'm taking this land for you, I want to pay rent, but I don't have anything. But the rent that I will pay is this, that I will induce all of my devotees for all the rest of the time in Kali Yuga, anyone who comes to see me in my temple must first come and offer their worship and honor to you, Lord Varaha Dev. So to follow this tradition, which very few people do, it will be very nice tomorrow if before going in to see Lord Balaji, we offer our honor, worship, and take blessings from Sri Bhuvaraha Dev, who are residing on the banks of the Swami Pushkarini a beautiful sacred lake, non different than the river Ganges, which absolves one's sins. Lord Varaha Dev told Srinivas that your eternal mother is living with me. She has been acting as a very faithful maidservant waiting for your incarnation. Her name is Bakula Malika or Vakula Devi. And she will take care of you. And she will put the herbs upon your forehead and love you like her own mother, like her own son. So Varaha Dev called for Vakula Devi. And when she saw Srinivas, immediately her motherly love just erupted within her heart. And Srinivas's love for her awakened. Bakula Devi embraced him. And she gathered the various herbs and placed it with camphor and saffron and musk and very sacred ingredients. And she made a paste and put it on Balaji's forehead. And to honor the love of Bakula Devi and to remember the Lord's willingness to sacrifice for the welfare of his devotee to this day, Lord Venkateshwar is wearing that sacred mixture of paste on his forehead. So Bakula Devi she showed such motherly affection. It is explained that previously Bakula Devi was Yashoda Mai. Krishna lived in Vrindavan for about approximately 12 and a half years. And it is the aspiration of every mother to arrange for her children's marriage. 
but Krishna left Vrindavan. And it was in Dwarka, when he was under the care of Vasudeva and Devaki, that he married eight queens and then 16,000 others. So Yashoda Mai was deprived of the opportunity to participate in these marriage ceremonies. But Krishna, knowing her heart, gave her the benediction that in a future incarnation, you will be my mother and you will make the arrangements for my marriage. Time passed. They lived in the forest together. He was often in his anthill doing tapasya. It came to his notice that in the forest on the top of the hill, there were some wild animals, many, tigers, lions, elephants, and they were harassing innocent people, sometimes even devouring them. So Srinivas told Bakula that I want to go out on a hunting excursion to protect the innocent from these dangerous animals. But as a mother, she said, no, no, you cannot go out there. It is very dangerous. It is a very st strange place. You should not go. But he was insisting. So finally, she accepted. So he put on the robe of a hunter with a bow and an arrow and a horse. And he went out. And there he saw a gigantic wild elephant. <coughs> the elephant was running. And Srinivas was galloping on his horse after the elephant. The elephant came into a garden. In that garden, there was a beautiful princess of the name Padmavati, along with her maidservants. The elephant lifted his trunk and offered praise to Padmavati Devi and then disappeared into the forest. Srinivas came right behind him. And when he saw Padmavati, who was standing, standing stunned by fear of the elephant that just approached her, Srinivas himself was stunned with her beauty. He got off of his horse. He said, who are you? Have you descended from the heavenly worlds? In this earth planet, there is no one so beautiful. There is no one so, so enchanting and so pure as yourself. Please tell me who you are. She said, my name is Padmavati. And I am the daughter of the king Aksharaj from the dynasty of the moon. And I'm here in the garden with all of my friends. Can you tell me, good sir, who are you? He said, I am also from a royal dynasty coming from the moon god. My father is Vasudeva and my name is Krishna. And now my mother has taken the form of Bakula Devi and she is searching to find a suitable wife for my marriage. <clears throat> and just then, the maidservants of the princess came and she saw this hunter talking with the princess. They were very offended by this. Who is, who are you? Who are you? What are you doing here? This. And they started warning Padmavati, you, you are a girl of great royalty. You cannot just be speaking to a hunter, a strange person alone in the forest. What is this? And Srinivas smiled and said, oh, oh, young maidservants, do not be alarmed. He said, I am in love with her and she is in love with me. And I am going to propose to marry her. Huh? Padmavati was, began to blush. She looked down and she said, you, first you have to ask my parents their permission. And the maidservants, they were very angry. 
You are seducing the princess? Get out from here, get out from here. They picked up stones and hurled the stones at Srinivas. Again and again they were throwing stones and they were chasing after him. He jumped on his horse and rode away and they were chasing after throwing stones. He was feeling great pain. He returned to the home of Vakula Devi. And she saw that he looked unhappy. Why are you unhappy? He said, because I am in love. But the girl that I love, I cannot go near. All her friends threw stones on me. Vakula Malika. She said, you are the Supreme Personality of Godhead. How could you be enchanted by a mere mortal woman of this world? But still, whatever you desire is my will, is my life. If you desire, I will go to that place to negotiate marriage with her parents. Srinivas said, you do not understand who this girl is. And he explained the story. There was a great sage who lived in the Treta Yuga. His name was Kushatvaj. He was performing a yajna. With great devotion, he was chanting Vedic mantras. From his mantra chanting, the goddess of fortune took birth. She took forth, forth, she took birth from the yajna of the chanting of the Vedic mantras. And therefore her father gave her the name Vedavati. When she grew up to marriageable age, she was so beautiful an ocean of good qualities. All great princes, kings, they wanted to marry her. Promising wealth, riches, luxuries, and immense pleasures. But she had no attraction to any of them. Her heart was fixed exclusively on Lord Vishnu. From his divine vision, Kushatvaj understood that she is a goddess of fortune. Only Lord Vishnu is suitable to be her, her husband. But it is not easy to attain Lord Vishnu. Kushatvaj sent his daughter into the Himalayan jungles to live all alone, to perform severe austerities, meditating on the lotus feet of Vishnu, to attract his mercy, to accept her as his wife. She remained in Himalayas for thousands of years, fasting, subjected, to the cold, snowy winters, to the hot, blazing summers, to the dangers of snakes and animals and insects, tolerating all difficulty. Such a great example. This is Vyavashayat Makabudhir A.K. Hakudunandana. Kings and princes and devatas were approaching to marry her, offering her royal palaces, offering her luxuries, jewels, fine garments and food. And not only that, but they were most handsome, chivalrous and opulent in all respects. She rejected them. For what? to live in the jungle, wearing a deer skin, doing tapasya for thousands and thousands of years. This is devotional service. 
We want Vishnu. We want devotional service to Krishna. He is our goal and ideal in life. So many things may come to us. Yes, the cheap things of this world, we may get money, we may get comforts, we may get fame, we may get so many things, we may get all kinds of uh, pleasures. But a devotee is willing to give it all up to perform austerity. And that's all we have is austerity. A sadhana bhakta is a person who gives up so many of the pleasures of this world for what? We don't even have Krishna. We're not tasting the love of Krishna. It's just tapasya. But that's the price. If we really want Krishna, we have to be willing with an empty heart of nothing except tapasya, carry on, even if it takes thousands and thousands and millions and millions of births. That was Mukunda Dutt's example. He was willing to suffer in separation faithfully for 10 million births if he knew in the end he would get even one glimpse of Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That is devotion. Enthusiasm and patience. That is the example of Vedavati. She gave up all the promises, hopes, and opportunities of this world to do severe austerity. And what did she get out of it? Just living in the forest. Thousands of years passed. One day, the king of the Rakshashas, Ravana, was flying by in the airways and he saw Vedavati. He was immediately enchanted by her beauty. He came down and looked closer. Oh, the exquisite elegance of her form, covered only with a, with a crude deer skin, hair becoming matted, but yet she was effulgent with elegant charm. Ravana could not control his senses. He approached her, assuming the form with one head and two arms, very, and we'll hear from the Sundarakanda that when Ravana when Ravana assumed this form, he was youthful and he was so magnificently handsome and strong. He was a scholar as well. He was speaking lovely poetry to win the heart of this girl. He was glorifying each limb of her body and the fragrance of her form. I am Ravana. I am the king. I have defeated Indra and all the devatas. I wish for you to be my wife. You come with me. She said, I have given my heart to Vishnu. How amazing. All this tapasya thousands of years, and Vishnu never showed himself to her even for a second. All this tapasya. But Vishnu was not showing himself. And here's a chance to live with the wealthiest man on earth. Hare Krishna. Most powerful conqueror of the earth. King of kings. She said, get out from here. I have given my heart to Lord Vishnu and I can accept no one else. Oh, when Ravana heard the name Vishnu, that really excited his anger. Now, what is this Vishnu? What is he doing for you? 
You're worshiping him for all this time and he's just leaving you alone with no companion in this jungle with nothing to eat. What is he doing for you? Come with me. I will give you the robes and the jewels of a queen. I will give you pleasures that even the most elevated damsels of the heavens cannot dream of. You come with me. She chastised him. That I have given my heart to Lord Vishnu. Get out from here. So Ravana went to take her by force. He grabbed her by the hair. And Vedavati, by her mystic power, she took her hand and just cut that hair right off. And Ravana fell back. Then Vedavati invoked the presence of Agni Dev in the form of fire. And then she spoke her final words to Ravana. Because you have touched my body, my body is forever impure. And therefore, I must end it today. But I will take birth again. And in my next birth, I will be the cause of your destruction and the extermination of your entire dynasty. And then her body was engulfed with flame. Sometime later, Suparnaka, the sister of Ravana, informed her brother about the beauty of Sita. And just by hearing the description of Sita's qualities, Ravana's heart was burning with desire. He induced Maricha to take the form of a magnificent deer and allure Ram and Lakshman away. At that time, Ravana came to kidnap the consort of Sri Ram. But it is not possible for a demon like Ravana to touch Sita Devi. Agni Dev appeared and he replaced the original Sita with Vedavati. Vedavati looked identical to Sita. The Kurma Purana calls her the Maya Sita, the false Sita. She's actually an expansion of the goddess of fortune. But not the original Sita. So it was Ravana, he thought he stole Sita, but in truth he stole Vedavati. And it was this Vedavati after thousands of years of tapasya, she still never even saw Ram. She came to the world and was immediately kidnapped by Ravana. <laughs> and she was screaming in the air and she threw some jewels down to the monkeys, Sugriva and Hanuman, when she was flying over Kishkindakshetra. And ultimately, she was a prisoner of Sri Lanka captive in the Ashoka groves of Ravana, where every day she was tormented. She was emotionally tortured. She was threatened in so many ways. Ravana was coming with the finest perfumes, the most elegant gowns, with, by his mystic powers, making himself the most handsome among men. Well-groomed hair with scented oils promising her jewels and gift and pleasures, everything, just become my consort. And she refused. 
So he would threaten her and scream at her and roar at her. And other rakshashas were tormenting her. And rakshashis, ugly rakshashis, horrible demonic beings were surrounding her practically day and night trying to just emotionally break her down to submission. And this went on for about 10 months. Vedavati performed all this tapasya and this is all she was getting. She did it all as a service to Sita Devi. Ravana would curse her. Ravana would threaten her. If you do not submit to me, I will chop your body in fine pieces and I will drink your blood and eat your flesh as my morning meal. These are your two alternatives. Either live as the primary queen of all the universe, as my queen, or die a miserable death and be eaten by me. Those were the two choices he gave. But Vedavati, so chaste, so absolutely pure, not even for one second ever deviated her mind from the loving remembrance of Sri Ramchandra. Lord Ram and Lakshman crossed over the bridge to Sri Lanka with the soldiers of Sugriva of the Vanara race. There was a great war. Ultimately, Vedavati's curse was fulfilled. All the sons, all the relatives, all the soldiers of Ravana were destroyed and ultimately Ravana fell to the ground dead. The Rakshasha race was exterminated of Ravana. Sita was brought back to Rameshwaram, where we will be going in a few days. It was Vedavati. And after all this time, first time Vedavati's actually seeing Sri Ram. And he rejects her. He says that how do I know you are perfectly chaste and pure? Living with such a great person as Ravana for 10 months, if even for one tenth of a second, your mind went astray from thinking of me, then you are not pure, you are not chaste, and I cannot have you. So you should be tested by fire. He ordered Lakshman to get big logs, big logs of trees, and started on fire. It was a blazing fire. <laughs> and Vedavati, in the role of Sita, she, she had absolute confidence of her chastity and her purity. She walked right into the fire. It was at that time, according to Kurma Purana, that Agni Dev appeared with the original Sita, whom he had taken away and put in the care of Parvati for all of this time. And Agni Dev explained to Sri Ram, "This is the real, the original Sita, and this is Vedavati, the Maya Sita who was taken by Ravana." Lord Sri Ramchandra accepted the real Sita as his wife. And Sita 
Sita told Ram that Vedavati has performed such devotional service, such sacrifice under the torments of the prisonership of Ravana for all this time. She did it all for me and you. Please accept her as your wife. This is her only ambition, her only ideal. And Lord Ram said, that in this incarnation, I have taken a vow of only one wife. So I cannot accept her in this incarnation. However, in a future incarnation, I will fulfill her desire and marry her. And Ram left with Sita. Vedavati still was alone with her mind fixed on the promise of the Lord. That was in Treta Yuga. The whole Dwapar Yuga passed. Krishna's Leela was manifested on this world and then it went to another universe. <laughs> Vedavati was waiting a long time through Treta Yuga, through Dwapar Yuga, and in Kali Yuga, she appeared. And it's a wonderful story how she appeared. In the dynasty of the moon, there was a great king of the Chola, the Chola family of the name Sudharma. Sudharma had two sons, Aksharaj and Tondaman. He raised them and they were loving brothers. When they were of age to take the responsibility of the kingdom, Sudharma accepted Vanaprast. He wanted to divide his kingdom in half before he left and give each of his two sons who were both worthy of being kings half of his kingdom. But the two brothers, they had such deep love for each other neither of them wanted half the kingdom. We will both rule the same kingdom together. We don't want to be separated. So that was the arrangement. Sudharma went to the forest, never to return. Aksharaj and Tondaman together ruled the kingdom as two kings, one kingdom. Amazing example of brotherhood. They weren't suing each other in courts. They were working together with total love and respect. Aksharaj, who was the elder of the two, all of his desires were fulfilled in the way he was ruling his citizens. Except one. He had no child. He longed for a child. He approached the Brahmins and they told him you should perform a yajna for the purpose of having a child. <laughs> so as part of the process of the yajna, the king had to plow several times around the yajna shala. So as he was plowing around and around and around, his plow got caught in something in the ground. And he pulled it. And out from the ground came an effulgent golden box. On its own, the box opened, revealing an exquisite golden lotus flower. In the world of the lotus flower was an effulgent little baby girl smiling 
and glancing mercifully upon everyone. Aksharaj picked up the little child and showed her to the Brahmins. And the Brahmins were amazed. They said, just as Janak Maharaj was plowing the fields around the, the Yajna, and from the earth came Mahalakshmi, the goddess of fortune Sita. In the same way, the goddess of fortune has come again. And because she has been found on a lotus flower, her name will be Padmavati. This Padmavati was Vedavati, who had taken birth again in this world. Aksharaj brought little Padmavati to, her, to his wife, Dharani Devi, and they raised her with great, great affection. When she came of marriageable age, it created a big problem in the house. Who possibly is qualified to marry Padmavati? So many people were coming and offering their proposals, but Aksharaj did not see that anyone was qualified. <laughs> One day, Narada Muni took the form of a Brahmin. And while Padmapati was sitting in a garden, he said, let me see your palms. He showed her palms. He saw beautiful lotus flowers in both palms. Narada Muni was ecstatic. Tears flowed from his eyes. I understand who you are. You don't know, but I know. You are the goddess of fortune who is incarnated on this earth. And Lord Vishnu will soon be your husband. But Mavati, she forgot what he said. So many Brahmins say so many things in this world. <laughs> Srinivas told Bakula Devi that this girl Padmavati is none other than my consort Vedavati, who has been performing tapasya for several yugas to gain me as her husband. Vakula said, I will go to negotiate the marriage. Vakula Malika went to a place called Kapileshwar, a temple of Lord Shiva. There she found the maid servants of Padmavati offering very fervent prayers. She asked, they told, that ever since our princess Padmavati left that garden where she met, met a strange hunter, she has fallen. She has fallen deadly sick. She has high fever. And Aksharaj and Dharani Devi. Her mother and father, they have brought the best doctors, every type of doctor, but nothing seems to work. She's dying, and nobody can understand the cause or the cure. So we have come here to pray to Kapileshwar to please give mercy and save her. Vakula Devi said, that is why I have come too. Please bring me, bring me to her mother and father. He said, yes, we will bring. You will give them hope. Meanwhile, Srinivas, it was his desire to elaborate this pastime. He took the form of a gypsy woman and 
had a mystical gypsy stick to put spells on people. And a little baby, and she was dressed just like a gypsy, very authentic. And she, she came into Narayanpuram, the capital of King Aksharaj. And she was calling out that I am a gypsy woman and I have great powers. I could cure the sick and I could read the future. So one of the maidservants of the queen, she ran and told Dharani Devi, Padmavati's mother, that there's a gypsy woman, can I bring her? She seems to know the future. I said, yes, bring her immediately. So Srinivas came in. So said, please tell, what is the problem with my daughter? What is the future? What will happen to my daughter? Please tell me, oh gypsy woman. He said, I will tell. I will access the goddess of the mountain to speak through me. But first, you must bring me rice, kumkum, turmeric, silk saris, and gold coins. And she set it all up very nicely and started chanting mantras. Said, now you must bring your daughter to me. Padmavati was brought in. Srinivas was very happy. The queen saw this gypsy woman gazing very deeply upon her daughter. <clears throat> said, show me your palms. Said, I know what is her illness. She met a very great personality. She has fallen in love with him. And due to separation, she is lovesick. The queen was insulted by this. What nonsense you're talking? My daughter lovesick. I said, yes. This is what happened, I know. I can see it. I can see the past and I can see the future. In fact, this person is none other than the Supreme Lord. The Supreme Lord who is living in the mountains of Sheshachala. He was hunting an elephant and he happened to see her daughter. And all, all her friends, when they saw this elephant coming, they all ran away and left your daughter alone. But this person was heroic. He came to rescue her. I know all these things. The goddess of the mountain is telling me. The queen rejected what the gypsy woman said. She said, the mother of this great personality is coming very soon to negotiate marriage. And you should accept it. And the gypsy woman left. Srinivas went back to his anjo. <laughs> At the next moment, Bakula Devi arrived through another door. But Bakula Devi, her stature was awesome. She had such majestic good qualities. Although she just lived as a very simple woman with no possessions in the forest, she had such dignity that Dharani Devi immediately was very deeply impressed and gave her a respectable greeting. And Bakula Devi offered her a plate made out of ivory that was covered with the most precious celestial jewels, presented it to the queen. So I have come to, a, to ask your daughter's hand for the marriage of my son, who is the Supreme Lord, living in the hills of the Vang of Sheshachal. <laughs> the 
queen said, what is this incarnation of God? I have not heard of any incarnation of Vishnu. An official who is full of all opulences were to incarnate in this world, what would he be doing living like a hermit in the jungles of the mountains? Let me speak to my king about this. Dharani Devi repeated the proposal to Aksharaj. Aksharaj consulted his ministers who were Brahmins said, we don't know of any incarnation of God on these hills. But the great sage, Shuka, he's living in those mountains. He is all-knowing. We should consult him. They all went to the hermitage of Shuka. Shuka said, yes, the supreme personality of Godhead Narayan is living in the hills of Shesha Chalam. And King Aksharad, you can never estimate your supreme good fortune that he wants to marry your daughter. Why does he want to marry your daughter? She is a goddess of fortune, his eternal consort. You should immediately, as soon as possible, arrange for this marriage. Aksharad, Shuka, and the other family members came together and selected the soonest auspicious date, which was on the next Ikadashi. And they wrote, Akshiraj wrote, a letter <laughs> to Srinivas, proclaiming that he is offering the hand of his daughter in marriage. So Vakula Devi and Sh the sage Shuka delivered that letter to the anthill where Srinivas was residing. Should I continue the story? Yeah. Just tell me when to stop, if you like. <laughs> Srinivas was very happy. Very happy. But the marriage was very soon. It was just a matter of days. And he wanted to invite all the demigods. So he meditated in his mind, and from his mind, Garuda and Anantadev appeared. And he gave them the order, invite all the principal demigods to come at once to my marriage. And soon they were coming, Rama, Shiva, Indra, Vayu, Agni, Surya, Yamaraj, very auspicious, everyone was coming. <laughs> When, when, when Srinivas saw the large crowds of very, very highly respectable people, he became unhappy. Brahma asked, what is the problem? All arrangements are being made. Why are you unhappy? He said, how are we going to feed all these people? I'm living in an anthill. I don't have anything. And we have to make elegant. This should be a glorious marriage. It should be an elegant marriage. We need to arrange all the decorations. And not only that, we have to feed everyone. Feasts of sumptuous prasad. But I have nothing. So Brahma, he called for Kuvera. Kuvera stood before Lord Srinivas with folded palms offering his repeated dandavats and said, My Lord, whatever I have is your property. You are the proprietor of everything that exists. The entire treasury of all the gods is ultimately yours. Just tell me and we will utilize it all. Lord Trinivas said, No. It is yours. I will not take anything from you but I will accept a loan. Kuvera wanted to give everything, but the Lord insisted, no, it must be a loan. I must set the principle. I guess it's a principle that for many marriages you need loans. But also the dignity of this avatar. He did not want to take his devotee's property. And then the Lord dictated the terms of the loan. 
He said, you give me 14 lakhs of gold coins with interest. And until the end of the Kali Yuga, whoever is really my devotee, when they come to see me to take darshan, they will give their valuables and their wealth to pay the interest of the loan that I owe to you for my marriage. It is because of this ingenious contract that the Balaji Tirupati temple is the wealthiest temple in all the world. I've seen people put their wedding rings in the hundi. Hare Krishna. People give so much valuables. But it is the duty of the devotees of Srinivas to keep the Lord's word. And he said, until the end of Kali Yuga, whoever my devotee is, when they come for my darshan, they will give substantial wealth to pay the interest. And then at the end of Kali Yuga, then I will give back the principal as well. So this arrangement was made. And all the very, very opulent arrangements of marriage were taking place. But Srinivas again was looking sad. And he was asked why. Padmavati could understand. Everyone could understand. Padmavati was not there at the time, I'm sorry. The demigods could understand. It was because Lakshmi Devi was still all alone in Kolapur performing tapasya. He did not want to marry Padmavati without the presence of Lakshmi Devi. So Srinivas called for Surya and told Surya, go to Lakshmi Devi and tell her that I'm sick, very sick, and she should come at once and then she will come. Surya was very afraid, but you're not sick. You're not sick. How could I tell Lakshmi Devi a lie? What will happen to me if I tell my Supreme Mother a lie? She will know. She knows everything. And Srinivas says, no, I will cover her by my Maya potency so she will believe you. And so you went to Kulapur, Kolapur and told Lakshmi Devi that Srinivas is living in the Venkatachala, the hills that cure all sins. And he's, and he's very sick, very sick, and he's asking for you to be by his side. So Lakshmi Devi said, I will go immediately. When she arrived, Srinivas fell to the ground pretending he was sick. And her heart became very soft. But then she saw so many guests in all directions. She was wondering, what's happening? Why all these guests? And then the Lord opened the curtain of Maya, Yoga Maya, so that Lakshmi could understand everything. She looked at her beloved Lord, Narayan, in the form of Srinivas, and said, I know what's happening. You are fulfilling your vow at last to marry Vedavati, who has appeared in this world as Padmavati. The Lord said yes. Lakshmi said, I am thrilled with joy that you will do this. It is my great happiness. In fact, I will personally perform the bathing ceremony to consecrate you for your marriage. Everyone was joyful. Lakshmi Devi consecrated the Lord with the holy bath. And then the Lord descended the mountain to Narayanpuram 
where Aksharaj was waiting with great opulence. And this marriage ceremony lasted for several weeks with great festivities and joy. In the end, Bakula Devi told Aksharaj, now my son must return to his home. So Padmavati and uh, Srinivas left the royal kingdom of Narayanpuram and went back up to the top of mountain, Tirumala, where they decided to reside in the ashram of Augustya Muni. In this way, they lived happily together. Some time passed. Padmavati noticed that there was a sadness in the heart of her beloved. She said, I know why you are sad. You are feeling separation from Lakshmi. Bring her back. Lord Srinivas said, but will she come back? She is still performing tapasya because of Rigamuni's kick on my chest. <laughs> will she come back? I said, of course she will come back. But what about you? Padmavati said, it will be the greatest honor and joy of my life to share my home with Lakshmi. Together we will serve you for all of eternity. So Lord Srinivas went to Kolapur to bring Lakshmi back. But Mahalakshmi, knowing he was coming, she disappeared, went to Patalaloka, where she took shelter in the ashram of Kapiladev the avatar of the Lord. The Lord could not find her. It was at that time that the Lord was told that he should perform tapasya to get Lakshmi back. On these Tirumala hills, he was to dig with his own hands a kund. He dug the kund, and then he had Varuna fill it with ambrosial waters of sacred rivers. And then he was to install a magnificent golden lotus flower. And he was to sit in the world of that lotus flower and meditate on Lakshmi Dev. He sat in that lotus flower. The power of his meditation, the power of his love in separation created a heat that was filling the entire universe. And ultimately it reached the heart of Lakshmi. And she consulted Kapila Muni, what should I do? Kapila Muni told her that your Lord, your beloved, he is feeling deep separation from you. He is performing tapasya to get you back. You should go to him. It is your heartfelt desire. Why are you taking so seriously this offense of Rigumuni? After all, it was the Lord's plan. Even if Rigumuni committed an offense by kicking him in the chest, what is the result? Now the whole world knows without exception of doubt that Lord Narayan is the supreme personality of Godhead, the king of all kings and the greatest object of everyone's worship. Brigal Muni, he has established that fact beyond doubt. So even if he committed some offense, the end justifies the means. He did a great thing. You should go back. You should forgive Brigumuni, and you should give pleasure to Lord Srinivas. 
That was just what Lakshmi Devi wanted to hear. With a blissful heart, she traveled through the stem of that lotus flower. And in a most miraculous, astounding way, through the lotus stem, she just appeared on the world of the golden lotus at the side of Srinivas, effulgent like millions of suns. Srinivas and Lakshmi Dev gazed upon each other. They were united again. Shri Venkateshwar Dev Ki! Should I continue? Brigu Muni came to that lotus flower, as did the devatas and the rishis and the sages and the devotees. Brigu Muni was just offering full obeisances again and again and again with tears of repentance in his eyes and begged forgiveness from Lakshmi Devi for what, she, what he had done. And Lakshmi smiled. She said, you are forgiven. You have done nothing wrong. This was all the Leela of my beloved Lord. And you were just an instrument of this Leela. On the Tirumala mountain, Lord Srinivas lived with Bakula, Lakshmi, and Padmavati for many years. The King Aksharaj meditating on Srinivas left this world. At that time, difficulty came upon the kingdom. After Aksharaj, Aksharaj had departed, his son, Basudan, he considered that he was the rightful king. But there was a problem because Aksharaj shared the kingdom with his brother, Tondaman, for all those years. Tondaman said that it was our agreement. Originally, Sudharma, our father, wanted to divide the kingdom in half for both of us, but due to our love for one another, we wanted to rule together. So we have been doing this. So now I should rule with you. Vasudan said, is it in writing? Where is it in writing? How can you prove it? It wasn't in writing. So Vasudan declared that his uncle was lying and that he would be the sole king. So there was a disagreement. The disagreement escalated. Different people of the kingdom were taking either person's side. And soon it came to the point where it was going to be a fratricidal war. On the battle, there was Tondaman's army and Vasudan, the son of Aksharaj's army. How sad. This is the age of Kali. If you don't put things in writing, nobody knows what is truth. <laughs> and we see this happening, even amongst devotees today. People make agreements, people make policies, and then as the years go by, different people have different versions of what was agreed on. And then there's fighting and battles, and brothers become enemies, and godbrothers become hateful, and everything is finished. Sri 
Srila Prabhupada warned us, it happened even in Gaudiya Mak. Prabhupada said when Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur was present, it was the most powerful united preaching team. Nothing could stop it. It had the capacity of just spreading Krishna consciousness, pure love of God throughout the world. But after Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur departed, and even just before he departed, There was conflict over who would get different properties, over who would get different positions, over who would get different facilities. And after he left, there was battles in the courts, and even battles with fists. And everyone, would, everyone believed they were right. It was just different interpretations and miscommunication. And the Gaudiya Math was splintered into dozens of different branches. Srila Prabhupada tried in every possible way to unite, to unite his God brothers again. And when he saw it was not possible, he took the mission of his Guru Maharaj to spread Krishna consciousness all over the world himself at the age of 70 with nothing, and he did it. Srila Prabhupada Ki So yes, here is a loving uncle and a loving son fighting over property and position. So they both wanted Srinivas on their side. So Srinivas went to Padmavati said, whose side should I be on? She said, she was so sad about this war. So sad. But she said, still, Vasudan is my brother. He's closest to me. You cannot go against him. So Srinivas gave his conch shell and his Sudarshan chakra to Tondaman. And he said he would he would be on the side of uh, Basuta. So the fight was raging, but there was a problem. Tondaman saw that because Srinivas was on the other side, none of his shoulders would fight enthusiastically because they all loved him. <clears throat> How can you fight against the ultimate object of your love? So his his army was being destroyed. He was losing the battle simply because no one wanted to fight against Srinivas. So he got so mad, he got so angry. Some say it was Tondaman, some say it was the son of Tondaman. That he took the chakra, the Sudarshan chakra that Srinivas gave them and threw the chakra, threw Vishnu's chakra at Vishnu. <laughs> and it hit him. And Vishnu fell to the ground. This is Leela. And he appeared lifeless. <laughs> Everyone stopped fighting then. <laughs> they all gathered around and they were all crying and praying, please come back, come back, come back, Srinivas, come back. And at that point, Tondaman and, and Vasudan was thinking, what nonsense are we doing fighting? Look at what the result of the fight is. That Srinivas is injured. He may be killed. They were all crying and weeping. And the news came to Augusta Muni's ashram. And Padmavati ran to the scene with Augusta Rishi. And she was weeping and crying. And seeing that, everyone's hearts were melting. And then Srinivas came back into consciousness. And they both said, everyone said, whatever you say, Srinivas, we will do. So Srinivas said, we will divide the kingdom in two parts, and Vasudharan, you be the king here, and Tondaman, you be the king here, and forever you live in harmony with each other. And that took place. After some days, Srinivas approached Tondaman, who was a very, very great and dear devotee. 
and said, in the place that Lord Varahadaev gave me, on the top of the mountain of Tirumala, build a glorious temple for me. That is where I will reside. Tongdaman, with great efforts, built the original temple of Tirumala. Srinivas, Lord Narayan, resided in that temple with Lakshmi Devi and Padmavati. And at one time, a very historical event, Srinivas said to Tondama and the great rishis and sages that were gathered, that as of now I have been speaking freely with human beings, acting as one of you. But the age of Kali is progressing. I will no longer speak to just anyone. I will manifest my body as a deity. And whoever comes to worship me with sincere devotion, I will deliver them from their sins and I will elevate them to Vaikuntha. Then Srinivas, stepping on the altar of the temple, manifested the Vigraha of Sri Venkateshwar. Shri Venkateshwar Bhagavan Ki Much louder, please. Shri Balaji Maharaj Ki The greatest of the Acharyas climb this mountain with their own feet as we are going to do tomorrow eager for the darshan of Sri Venkateshwar Shankaracharya came here to worship and later on the great Vaishnavacharya Ramanujam Ramanujam declared according to the Shastras that these seven hills are Vaikuntha on earth. Ramanujacharya was living in Sri Rangam. Ramanujacharya was living in Sri Rangam. But singing the songs and the hymns of the Alavars always put him in a trance of ecstatic love. And one time while reading the glories of Tirumala and the Lord Sri Venkateshwar, he told his devotees, we will go there. came to the foot of the hill and performed his bhajan, giving lectures on the absolute truth. One of his disciples, Anantacharya, he was living up there on the Lord's order, taking care of a garden, Knowing that his guru was down at the bottom of the mountain, he came down and asked him, please come up, please come up. But Ramanujacharya said, how can I put my feet on that mountain? It is not different than Anantashesha. It is Anantashesha's body. It is Vaikuntha, the spiritual world. I cannot go. But he said, Ramanuja, my guru Dev, if you do not go, then nobody will go. Even the Pujaris, if, if 
you, the most holy and saintly and pure of all beings, are not willing to put your feet on the mountain. What is our position? The Pujaris will come down. No pilgrims will go up there. Balaji will be up there all alone. You must come, please. So in the persuasion of the devotees, Sri Ramanujacharya climbed As he was climbing, one of his spiritual masters, Sri Shaila Purna, came with garlands and prasad to greet Ramanuja when he was just close to the top of the mountain. Ramanuja Charya said to his senior elder guru, he said, why did you come with all this load of prasad and garlands yourself? Why didn't you bring it, why didn't you just send a junior devotee to do this? You are very old and it's very difficult for you. Sri Shailapurna responded, yes, it is the proper etiquette for me to send a junior devotee. But I looked in all directions and I could not find a single soul junior to myself. I am the junior most. I am the most neophyte of everyone. So I had to do the chore myself. This is what a guru of Ramanujacharya was speaking. Sri Ramanujacharya's heart melted with the humility of a true Vaishnava. He stayed on the top of the hill for three days, having the darshan of Sri Balaji in great ecstasy. It is explained that over a period of time, Balaji has four hands. Over a period of time, the Vaishnavas worship him as Vishnu, but the Shivites worship him as Lord Shiva. The followers of Shankaracharya consider that Balaji is Shiva. And the followers of Ramanujam and others considered him Vishnu. So should we put the drum of Shiva and the trident in his arms, in his hands? Or should we put the conch shell in the disc? There was a dispute. And you know how religious people can be when there's a dispute <laughs> over theological issues. It was a heated debate. <laughs> Ramanujacharya proposed a solution. He said that all followers of Shankar, you put Shiva's drum and Shiva's trident before the deity. And I will put the conch shell and Sudarshan chakra before the deity. And then We'll all leave the deity room and lock the door so no one has any possibility of coming in. And in the morning, we'll open the door and see which symbols the Lord is holding. Can you imagine the intensity of that night? I didn't read this, but I don't think anyone slept that night. <laughs> because this was, in South India, this was like the ultimate deity. Is it Shiva or Vishnu? In the morning, the doors were open, and Sri Venkateshwar were holding the symbols offered by Sri Ramanuja Charya of the conch shell and Sudarshan Chakra Venkateshwar Bhagavan Ki! <laughs> Sri Ramanuja Charya descended from the hill with 
was about to depart for Sri Rangam, Sri Shaila Purna offered to teach Ramanujacharya Valmiki Muni's Ramayan for one full year in Tirupati. Ramanujacharya remained here in Tirupati for that year studying Sri Ramayan. Sri Padmatvacharya came here to Venkateshwar's Mandir, resided for some time and worshipped Sri Balaji with great love and devotion with his disciples. Sri Padmatvacharya came here and worshipped Sri Balaji with his disciples. In Sri Chaitanya Bhagavat, we find Nityananda Prabhu's pilgrimage, he came to Tirumala to worship Sri Venkateshwar with great love and devotion. And in Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he walked up the same, same path that we'll be going tomorrow. presence of Sri Venkateshwar in ecstatic love. He offered his prayers. He danced with his arms raised, inducing everyone around to chant. If we are fortunate, we will see the lotus footprints of Lord Chaitanya that he installed here. And Srila Prabhupada himself came here. It is written about in his biographies to take the darshan of Sri Balaji. And he was very, very deeply impressed. In fact, he told devotees that we should learn how to manage a temple very nicely and worship the deity so beautifully from Venkateshwar Today, after lunch prasad, which will be served if I ever end this long lecture. <laughs> we will be visiting the temple of Padmavati. Tomorrow, for those with the strength, providing there's no cyclone rains, by Yoga Maya's potency, Christmas is such an immensely crowded place, time for Tirupati. More people come on pilgrimage here than any other temple in the entire world. Even though it's so difficult to get to. And Christmas time is a time when people all around have holidays. So this place should be swarming with hundreds and thousands of people, millions of people. However, because there are cyclones in Andhra Pradesh, the vast majority of people are afraid to come. So the last few days I've been living on the top of Tirumala Mountain, and there's hardly anyone there. It's a great benediction. <laughs>
whoever is suffering from the cyclone, we definitely offer our prayers and our sympathies and pray for the Lord's <laughs> compassion upon them. But it's, at the same time, there is some, some good that we can. So tomorrow, those who are fit, we will leave at 4 o'clock in the morning. And the meeting place will be announced. And we will, following in the footsteps of Sri Shankaracharya, Ramanuja Acharya, Nityananda Prabhu, Lord Chaitanya, Prabhupada drove up. So those who drive will be following in the footsteps of Prabhupada. <laughs> <laughs> and tomorrow we will be having the Darshana Sri Venkatesh for Balaji. And the Darshan is very fast. It's not like Radha Govinda temple where you can stand all day long and <laughs> chant prayers. In Vekateshwar temple you only get a few seconds and you're chalo chalo <laughs> pushed forward. But it's amazing. Sometimes people stand in line for 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, just standing in line for all these hours. They have to bring tiffins and just eating while standing in line. Sleep at night where they're in line. Just to get a three second darshan. Chalom, chalom. And in certain ways, in some people, they shave their heads. There's a certain hall where they shave heads. Hundreds and hundreds of people a day, men, women, everyone. As a traditional offering amongst the devotees of Balaji, an offering of, of surrender. Sometimes when things are too easy to achieve, we take it cheaply. <coughs> or as they say, for granted. The things that are very hard to achieve. We meditate on its value more deeply. So this is one of the wonderful experiences about Venkateshwar. So much trouble to come here, and then to get up the hill, and then to stand in line, and then just a second or two, and then you're wished away. But for that second or two, just offering the deepest heartfelt prayers, praying for mercy, and beholding the form of the Lord with much intensity. That is what we should do. But factually, that is how we should behold the deity all the time. When Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in Jagannath Puri standing and gazing upon Lord Jagannath, there would be tears pouring from his eyes, his limbs trembling. And however much time he was standing before Jagannath, it was never enough. That is love. What should we pray? Nadananda Janamda Sundarim Kavitam Bajakati Shaka Mama Janmani Janmani Shwari Bhagavatam Bhakti In the line of Lord Chaitanya and the six Goswamis, our prayer is for eternal service. Our prayer is for pure unalloyed love. We want nothing else. My Lord, if you want to embrace me or trample on me or make it broke me heart, broken hearted by not being present before me, as you like, I am your servant unconditionally. 
Many business people have become wealthy by praying to Balaji. By offering gifts to Balaji. Many sick people have become healthy by offering their hearts to Balaji. But we do not want Karma Mishra Bhakti. We do not want liberation, the desire of the Jnana Mishra Bhaktas. We want Shuddha Bhakta. We want pure devotion. What is pure devotion? Samsidhi Radhi Tosha. My Lord, how may I please you? Let me just be your servant unconditionally. That is my ultimate ideal, my ultimate aspiration. And even in the footsteps of Vedavati, if I have to suffer for yugas, I will never give up the hope of the shelter of your lotus feet. In this spirit, let us worship the Lord and chant his holy name. I would like to add one thing before we end today's class. When I talk about ending class, I see that all of you are becoming very wide awake. <laughs> In Sri Chaitanya Bhagavat, Srila Vrindavan Das Tagur, he gives a wonderful purport to the story of Bhrigu Muni. He said, actually, Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva, they were not negatively affected by Bhrigu Muni. They both pretended to get angry because they wanted Lord Krishna to be glorified as their supreme master for all of eternity. This is Vaishnav. Even at the cost of their own reputation, even at the cost of their own devotees, They want to give the world the highest benediction, the chanting of Krishna's holy name. Srila Prabhupada ki, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu ki, Sri Harinam Sankirtan Ki yeah. Ananti Koti Vaishna Brinda Ki yeah. Sri Venkateshwar Ki yeah. Sri Tirupati Chetra Ki yeah. Go Primarandi yeah. Vijayanesh Radha Swami Maharaj Ki yeah.